This is the Law and Policy Conference, and every year we address um, legal services issues and adjudication issues, and we've already started to address those issues in earlier panels today. Um, this year we have lots to report, federal, state, local funding for immigrant services and for related services, as well as extraordinary pro bono and NGO initiatives targeting unaccompanied children and parents with children. Um, clearly not enough, but nonetheless remarkable progress. It's, it's amazing to me that right, the, you know, the right to counsel has become kind of a mainstream issue in our field, which I think is, I think is absolutely terrific. We also have a superb study that we're going to talk about today that government-funded legal counsel would be cost-effective for exactly the reasons that many of us always thought it would be cost-effective, so we're going to go over that. At the same time, the bad news is we're still dealing, in fact, more so than ever with a shamelessly under-resourced court system, too few judges, too few staff, too few resources for everything, and that system is becoming further buried in, in cases. Uh, the backlog right now is 408,000 cases. You can imagine the kinds of resources that would be needed to work down that backlog, take on the existing cases, assume those cases, and then deal with the with the recent influx of cases. We've seen more and more removals occur outside the formal removal system and, or um, removals that receive only at best a cursory review by an, by an immigration judge. In 2010, the ABA Commission on Immigration Reform spoke about, quote, the shift toward a removal system in which immigration courts play no or only a perfunctory role and DHS is responsible for all steps in the process from apprehension and detention to issuing the order and deporting the individual. That was 2010, and those are very prescient words in, in retrospect. This is precise, precisely what's occurring now, an increase in non-judicial, processless, or mostly non-judicial, mostly processless removals, up to the point that about 80% of all removals never really see the inside of a court system. So we're talking about reinstatement of removals in 2013, almost 160,000 of them. And those are cases, as is, uh, is Mark said today, and others that have raised real equities. Those are often people that have been in the community for a long, long time. Expedited removals, more than 100,000 per year. Administrative removals by DHS, we really don't know the numbers on those, but they're significant. Stipulated orders of removal in which a non-citizen waives his or her right to a formal removal proceeding, often due to pressure from government officials or because they don't want to stay in detention for any longer. And we've also seen accelerated or prioritized formal removals in which IJs fa fast-track cases. So Austin Fragaman is going to begin the panel today. He's right to my right. And he'll speak on some of the progress that has been made on right to counsel issues over the last few years. Senator Lara, Nisha, Maria, Barbara Lean have already spoken on these issues, but we're going to delve into them more deeply. Austin's law firm, I should say, has contributed very substantially to some of the progress that's been made in this area. It's made a major commitment to the representation of unaccompanied children in partnership with several groups, Kids in Need of Defense, the Florence Project, and Casa Cornelia of San Diego. Next will be Meredith Linsky, the director of the ABA Commission on Immigration. She'll speak on the legal challenges related to representing unaccompanied children um, and also detainees on the U.S.-Mexico border. And she'll also speak a bit, I think, to the rise in informal non-judicial removal cases and what that means for uh, a legal advocate. Meredith is the perfect person to do this. As you may know, she was, before being named the commission, head of the Commission for Immigration, she was the director of the um, South Texas Pro Bono Asylum Representation Project in Harlingen, also known as ProBar, from 2000 to 2014. Next, Judge Dana Marks and her, not Dana, Dana Marks, this is how she tells me that you actually prove that you know her because people <laughs> say Dana otherwise. Judge Dana Marks in her capacity as the longtime president of the National Association of Immigration Judges is going to talk about a lot of things, but particularly I think the accelerated adjudication of normal removal cases. In a July letter to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and Senate Minority Leader, at least for now, I guess, Mitch McConnell, she argued very strenuously against fast-track hearings for minors, 
and she also very eloquently described how legal counsel benefits the immigration court system. She's also going to speak on the uh, immigration judge's perspective on court resources and non-court removals. And this will lead to a final presentation, last but certainly not least, by John Montgomery, who's the senior vice president at NERA Economic Consulting. Prior to joining NERA, Dr. Montgomery worked as an economist for the Federal Reserve Board, the President's Council for Economic Advisors, the International Monetary Fund, and Morgan Stanley. He holds a doctorate in economics from Princeton University. He's going to provide an overview of his study on the cost effectiveness of legal representation and removal proceedings. We're going to have the panelists each speak for 10 to 12 minutes, and then I may have a question or two, and then we'll open it up to you. So, Austin. Uh, thank you very much, Don. I'm pleased to be here. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, I've been asked to lead off the panel with talking about progress that's been made regarding um, access to counsel uh, for immigrants in the past um, year or so. And as you all know, traditionally there's been no government funding for representation of aliens. Um, but the recent crisis caused by the arrival of the unaccompanied children from Central America has spawned um, new efforts on a state level, a federal level, um, local governments, um, trying to find a way to assure that no child has to go before an immigration judge um, unaccompanied. And of course, at the same time, we have um, age NGOs in the pro bono community, as well as private law firms, um, creating a number of new programs to also address the issues of uh, unaccompanied children and detained aliens in general. Um, so I want to focus on a, a few of the different um, efforts that are, um, uh, that are going on and uh, my um, uh, remarks will, will certainly um, not be all inclusive of every uh, organization and everything they're doing. We, we'd be here a very long time just going through what everybody's doing in New York. So I just want to highlight um, a few of these programs that I think are particularly significant. Um, brief mention was made of the um, Senate bill. You remember that bipartisan bill that passed with great hoopla that we all thought was going to um, save the day, S-744? Um, and that would have required uh, the appointment of government-funded counsel to unaccompanied children or migrants with serious mental disabilities or other particularly vulnerable individuals, and it would have um, appropriated uh, $20 million uh, for this purpose. Um, a bill was introduced by uh, Representative Hockham Jeffries, the Vulnerable Immigrant Voice Act, um, which, which uh, mirrors the provisions of the Senate bill. Um, Congressman Jeffries, in a, in a recent presentation that he made at the Association of the Bar in, in New York City, um, gave the probability of his bill going anywhere um, in the rest of this Congress um, uh, a zero. Um, so I think he would probably know. Um, and of course, the Obama administration, as you know, had um, requested $3.7 billion in supplemental funding to address the unaccompanied um, children crisis, um, 20 million of which would have been uh, allocated to HHS for legal and health care services. Um, now, the bill hadn't passed either um, or hasn't gone anywhere, and so um, I think that the probability of congressional um, uh, resolution of these problems is fairly uh, remote at this point. And I think you heard a little bit about that uh, earlier. Um, so let's take a look at what the government agencies are doing. And um, uh, I think that, you know, the previous panel um, raised the uh, specter of the government actually stepping forward um, and taking uh, some initiative in this area, which is um, uh, long overdue. Uh, specifically, HHS is providing $9 million over two years for lawyers to represent unaccompanied minors in removal proceedings. And this is very significant because through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is the agency charged with housing unaccompanied minors who arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border, and then finding them uh, sponsors, um, organizations or families, um, custodians, 
um, that they would uh, that they could live with while they go through removal proceedings. Um, but because of that special role, it's particularly significant that um, this is the first time that they've ever had um, the opportunity to directly fund uh, lawyers for unaccompanied minors. So this is a major breakthrough. Um, Barbara mentioned the um, $2 million in grants through Justice AmeriCorps. Um, I think that's a terrific program. Um, it's going to involve 100 lawyers and paralegals to represent children in proceedings. Um, unfortunately, the salary level is capped at $19,800 per year, um, which might pose some problems for recruitment. <laughs> um, so what, but it, what it do mainly does is these um, uh, Justice AmeriCorps fellows are placed with um, other organizations and, and um, they would probably need to supplement uh, the salary. Um, states have stepped forth, uh, have stepped forward, um, and uh, California, for instance, has um, allocated $3 million uh, for this purpose to be given to um, nonprofits, the City of San Francisco, um, the Oakland City Council, and Alameda County Board of Supervisors are considering um, legislation at the present time. In New York City, there's been um, probably a better, uh, a, a longer standing um, effort, um, at least in the past several years, um, for the city to actually um, provide some, some serious funding. Um, we'll start out with the uh, City Bar Justice Center of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, of, of which I uh, was served as the uh, chairman, and during my uh, tenure there, um, th we established a uh, full-time pro bono a uh, fellow um, to handle uh, immigration matters funded, funded by our firm, actually. Um, and together with the City Bar Justice Center, um, established the uh, Varick Removal Defense Project. Um, and in that, under that project, which started in 2008, um, which was created um, in response to a petition signed by 100 detainees decrying the poor conditions um, on Varick Street and the lack of counsel. Um, under that particular program, uh, the City Bar Justice Center collaborated with AILA, which is one of the leading organizations, and the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and the Legal Aid Society to uh, launch the New York City Know Your Rights Project. And under this model, volunteer attorneys from participating firms conducted um, screening interviews with detainees in the facility and worked with volunteer uh, AILA experts to determine whether any relief was available. Um, we were able to determine that approximately, um, based on 400 detainees, that about 40 percent of them had um, uh, legal uh, issues that were um, worth pursuing. The Varick Street Project went on um, to place a variety of detention cases with leading law firms for full representation of the detainees. Um, the project was um, receiving referrals from the New York Defender Organizations, um, probably uh, primarily for pr uh, preliminary screening. And the screening was um, conducted by um, a, a team of volunteer attorneys uh, from participating law firms. Um, and um, the Varick Street Project, acting as the um, organization to provide in-house training, expertise, and mentoring through AILA and the fellow um, that we had uh, established at the, um, at the City Bar uh, Justice Center. In any event, what we learned from this project um, was probably not surprising. Um, the detained um, aliens were not the uh, ideal circumstance for pro bono lawyers from um, firms to uh, represent um, because the cases were tended to be extremely complex, um, frequently lasted for significant amounts of time, and required um, a huge amount of uh, mentoring. Um, the New York uh, Immigrant Family Unity Program um, came along, and that was uh, arose out of the Katzman study. And Judge Katzman, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his fine work. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. He's the chief judge of the Second Circuit, um, and has been um, just totally focused on this issue of um, legal representation, particularly to detained aliens um, in the New York area and, and nationally. 
um, really uh, kicked off this program. And the city of New York um, provided $500,000 in 2003 and raised that to $4.9 million in 2004 um, to um, allow um, for the representation of detained immigrants. And the funds went to um, primarily uh, the Bronx Defender Service, Brooklyn Defenders Legal Aid, um, and, and other uh, local uh, or legal defense organizations. The New York City Council also has entered into a um, public-private uh, partnership to provide um, $1.9 million, uh, which is focusing on providing access to counsel for children in uh, removal uh, proceedings. And the, no, uh, the monies have been allocated to a number of partner agencies, um, some of whom provide direct representation through staff attorneys and some of whom um, accept referrals from the uh, regular juvenile docket and the surge ju juvenile docket, as we call it in New York. Um, and some of whom will be place, uh, placed with pro bono attorneys from New York law firms. Um, probably the most remarkable program that's come along is uh, also rose out of the Katzman study, and that's the Immigrant Justice Corps. And the Immigrant Justice Corps um, essentially is um, oh, a, a Peace Corps for immigration um, lawyers. Um, and it's become clear, as I mentioned before, that the uh, most effective way to provide representation to detained immigrants and in difficult cases um, is to have a cadre of well-trained immigration lawyers available. Um, the Robin Hood Foundation um, provided seed money, $1.4 million, to um, fund the um, IJC, as we call it. Um, and um, established um, fellows, a fellowship. Um, each fellowship lasts for, t for uh, two years, and they're basically starting out with uh, 25 fellows per year um, and providing um, some supervisory personnel, um, project managers, et cetera. Um, also looking for um, funding from law firms, asking law firms whether they would be willing to sponsor a, um, uh, an Immigrant uh, Justice Corps fellow. Um, uh, we, we did that as well as a number of other firms and certainly encourage any of you from law firms to, um, to do that. It's a terrific program. Um, and it's estimated by the third year the Immigrant Justice Corps will be able to handle 15,000 cases a year um, which doubles the number of uh, immigration cases currently overseen by nonprofit organizations in, in, as a whole in New York. So this will be um, really a phenomenal uh, addition. Um, the NGOs um, have been very active as well. Legal Aid, AILA, the Dador, Safe Passage, and Catholic Charities all came together over the summer and formed I Care Consortium to cover the juvenile docu dockets in the Immigration Court in New York City. Um, so working together with the Immigration Court, um, they came up with a very organized way of counsel being um, uh, identified um, in those cases where counsel is necessary, particularly for um, unaccompanied children. Um, Private law firms um, have been very active in this area. Um, Don mentioned um, some of the things that, that our firm was doing. Um, we're, um, uh, we're fortunately um, not, uh, not the only ones doing this. There's quite a robust effort. Um, the administration, uh, after the funding bill failed, um, called together um, in the White House a number of uh, different law firms, large firms primarily, um, and uh, a number of uh, organizations that deal with um, providing legal services and tried to get everyone together to um, try to encourage the private bar um, to step up to the plate and engage in a big way in representing unaccompanied uh, aliens, and I think that was uh, quite, uh, quite successful. Um, we're also working on a, uh, together with the Safe Passage Project, and some of you may know Professor Lenny Benson from um, Brooklyn Law, I mean from, excuse me, from New York Law, who's been very involved in this, together with um, uh, my fellow co-author of a number of pu publications, Corrine uh, Shannon, who's an adjunct professor at Cardoza, are doing a book 
um, which will be the definitive work on um, representing uh, unaccompanied uh, children and all the various issues, which will be um, published by PLI, I understand. And um, they're also going to have training videos, um, webinars, webcasts, podcasts, all done through PLI as well, who's very uh, committed to this project. Those of you who don't know PLI, that's the Practicing Law Institute in, in, in New York City. Um, a number of um, firms have sent um, attorneys to um, Artesia and to um, Carnes um, to work with aliens, um, and um, uh, that's been a, a tremendously successful effort. The problem is um, that these um, locations are extremely remote um, and difficult, and you can't just go there for the day and do a few cases and go home. You've got to go camp out there for a while. Uh, we just had one of our associates get back from spending uh, a month in, um, in, in uh, Artesia. So um, other firms, Jones Day, Aiken Gump, have been very involved with that. I see um, uh, Karen Grise from um, Freed Frank sitting here, and um, she's really taken a strong leadership position with other law firms as well in providing these services. So um, I know this isn't an exhaustive list, but um, I think the, um, the reality, however, is that the unaccompanied children situation and the uh, detained alien crisis in general uh, has served as a catalyst in um, creating programs. Um, which hopefully will be uh, sustainable and greatly increase the capacity um, to provide uh, legal services and created models um, which can be uh, applied um, throughout the country um, and, and easily uh, adapted. And um, I think that overall um, we're, on a, we're in a good track um, in terms of providing access to counsel and hopefully um, these new programs collectively will make a big difference. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Meredith Linsky, and as Don already mentioned, I'm the director of the Commission on Immigration at the American Bar Association. But before moving to D.C. in February of this year, I worked on the border at ProBar um, in Harlingen, Texas for 15 years. And Harlingen is an area in the southmost tip of Texas um, in the Rio Grande Valley. The valley runs from Rio Grande City to Brownsville. And it's also the southernmost tip of the continental U.S. and the closest point from Central America to the United States. And that is one of the reasons, I believe, that there is such a large uh, migration pattern from Central America and Mexico into South Texas. Um, living on the border for 15 years taught me that what happens at the border is often invisible. And it's the first place where highly restrictive enforcement-oriented policies are piloted, established, and then expanded. Um, these are policies like expedited removal that was initiated with IRAIRA back in 1996, but expanded to the land borders in late 2005-2006. Um, it began with pilot projects, if I remember correctly, in Laredo and in the McAllen area and maybe San Diego, I don't remember right now, um, but has been expanded throughout the entire southwest border. And the south and, and Rio Grande City is one of the cities where there, there's enforcement. There's enforcement all over the border, and the enforcement just increases and increases, and it's highly, highly invisible to the public until the surge hit. And until there was an incredible amount of media attention over the summer where people like Julia Preston spent many, many days, many, many weeks coming down to the Rio Grande Valley and writing stories about what was happening with the surge, with the unaccompanied children, with the families, and also with adults. Because for many, many years, adults have been entering into the United States and quickly being returned to Central America and Mexico um, through voluntary returns, but most recently through expedited removal orders. And I'm gonna talk about what that means practically and the consequences for immigration cases. The other thing that I often say about South Texas is that the only constant is change. The only thing that stays the same is that things will change. And what, what changes depends on outside influences. Some of those influences are the migration flows. The other influences are the availability of detention bed space, 
and also administration and agency priorities. Things can change on such a, a, a level as a new ICE officer or someone who has a new vision of what they want to do and what they want to see in the border. But the truth is, from 1989, when I first arrived at the border, until today, things change constantly. When, when the policies are terrible and you think you're never going to be able to get another person out of detention or, or win another removal case, it shifts, and vice versa. That said, um, much of what we've seen over the last dec decade on the border was confirmed and documented in the recent MPI report. I don't know how many of you had a chance to read this report. I think it's fantastic. I want to congratulate Mark and Doris and others on this report. It really has made visible what we've been living on the border for the past 11 years. And I do want to just borrow some of the statistics, if you don't mind, to make the point that, for example, the vast majority of all removals in the country take place at the border. And that's 60% in 2012 and 70% in 2013. That's an increasing percentage from perhaps 10 or 15 years ago, where it would have been much, much lower. The majority of the removals at the border are, are non-judicial in nature. They're administrative. And there is no recourse, and there is no involvement in the immigration court. And that's something that I think many people are surprised about. They don't realize that the number of people that enter the country are apprehended, are detained, and may be turned around with a removal order within five days, even less, three days, depending on the consulates and the cooperation between the consulates and ICE. For example, I know in South Texas that for removals to Honduras and Guatemala, it can be less than a week. Um, I think that ICE, it takes a little bit longer for them to, to work with the Salvadoran um, consulates, and you know, that may be for very good reasons. 52% um, of these non-judicial removals on the border are expedited removal orders. The other percentage are reinstatement of removal orders and administrative removal, and we'll talk about what those are exactly in a few minutes. 95% of the people who are removed at the border are from Mexico and the three Northern Triangle countries of Central America. And like I said, there's been always a history of immigration um, from Central America and Mexico through South Texas. But you won't be, or you may be surprised to know that there are also many individuals from from Africa, from Southeast Asia, and from many countries throughout the world who enter the United States through South Texas because they fly to South America or Central America and then travel up through Mexico. It's an established smuggler route, and, and many, many people enter that way. For example, for Cubans, Brownsville, Texas is the number one entry, land entry point in the United States because the patterns are established and people come in through Brownsville. Any day in Brownsville, Texas, if you go to the Gateway Bridge, you'll see dozens of Cubans um, applying for parole and entry into, into the United States. Um, another reality at our border is that, and from the MPI report tells us, that 76% of all apprehensions occur within three days and 90% of apprehensions occur within 14 days. Um, that makes sense because of the increase in enforcement at the border and also the fact that expedited removal is, uh, is implemented and used against people who are in the United States for 14 days or less. Um, I think that expedited removal has been one of the tools that ICE has used um, to the maximum to, to remove the highest number of people possible with the lowest um, amount of resources, really. Um, and then, of course, there's always the impact on the federal courts and what it means for people to be prosecuted for illegal entry and illegal reentry. You may have someone who comes to the United States for the very first time. Um, it may be a 20-year-old woman from El Salvador who's coming to join a partner or her mother or come to work, and she's prosecuted for illegal entry given an expedited removal order, sent back to her home. She may come back, and then when she comes back, if she's apprehended after crossing, she's placed in reinstatement of removal proceedings. Um, she could be prosecuted for illegal reentry, or maybe not, 
And then if she wants to apply for relief and fears persecution, she would have to go through the, the reinstatement of removal, ask for a reasonable fear interview, and could be detained up to six months or nine months because that process is very, very slow. Um, we've heard a lot today about the unaccompanied minors, so I don't want to repeat too much of that, but um, I think that we all know that over 68 1,000 unaccompanied minors have entered the country between October 1st of last year and September 30th of this year. That's a 77% increase over the previous year. And the number is almost the same for family units, 68,445 family units entered the U.S. That's a 361% increase over the previous year. The vast majority of people have entered at the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. Um, I don't know the percentage exactly, but if I had to guess, I'd say, I don't know, 80? 75, something like that. Um, I want to talk about how enforcement is applied against different groups who enter the United States. For example, unaccompanied children from contiguous countries, unaccompanied children from non-contiguous countries, family groups, and adults, the four main groups that are, that are apprehended at the border. Um, I'd like to start with children from contiguous countries. So we're talking about children from Mexico and Canada, but of course, on the southern border, I never saw a Canadian child. <laughs> um, maybe there was one once. Um, but in terms of the Mexican children, they have the least amount of due process of anyone. Um, these kids have no right to go before an immigration judge. They don't even have a right to ask for a credible fear interview, actually. They're apprehended by CBP, Customs and Border Protection. Um, they're brought to a CBP processing station. They're processed, their information is taken, and the agent is supposed to screen them for risks of trafficking, risks of persecution, and for a willingness to return to Mexico. If the child does not screen into the system, then he or she is swiftly brought to the, to the border, to the bridge, handed over through interagency agreements to the local consulate. Um, is, the information is given at the bridge, I, I've seen it happen, and then swiftly returned to Mexico. This happens regardless of whether the child has lived for hours or days or years in the United States. I represented a young man who, I don't remember if he was 16 or 17 when he was apprehended at a bus stop in Brownsville, Texas. He had just graduated from high school in Brownsville and had taken a placement test to go to the University of Brownsville for college courses. And he was apprehended. Um, the officers asked him if he had documents. He did not. And they swiftly returned him to Mexico. Um, he obviously didn't screen in. I don't even know if they asked him the questions, truthfully. Um, but he was told that he'd be able to come back and that it would be an easy process for him to come back legally. So he spent two years in Mexico um, living in some friend of a friend of a friend's grandfather's floor, sleeping on the floor, uh, working at a chicken restaurant um, while we worked to get his mother and, and uh, a U visa and a derivative U visa for him and did bring him back after two years. But that was, you know, it, it just happened to be a case that we caught, that someone called us, that, that had relief. And, you know, this child may not have screened in based on persecution or, um, you know, maybe he said he wanted to go back. Perhaps he was fearful for his undocumented mother who was living in Brownsville. So this was a really disconcerting case. Fortunately, it had a happy ending, but these are the kinds of things that we see on the border all the time. Um, and I think that there, there needs to be more attention paid to the Mexican children and what happens to them. And I think they do need to have more access to legal information and lawyers, and maybe that's something that we can work on in the future. Um, as many of you know, the children from the non-contiguous countries, and that's mainly Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, um, do go through an immigration court process. Their first um, processed by CBP, they're transferred to Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelters, where they may be for seven to 30 days. 
Um, this is a, a much speedier reunification process than used to exist uh, back in, in the day. Um, in 2011, 2012, they were held for maybe 60 days, 45 days. That gave the legal service providers, like ProBar, time to really build rapport and get to know the children. The surge happened, and then all of a sudden, it was very, very difficult for the service providers to get to know the children, to identify those who, who had relief, to triage the cases, and really um, get the facts in order to make the referrals before the children were gone. Because once they're gone, it's very difficult to stay in touch with them, and that has been an ongoing challenge for the legal service providers. Um, so the children do still have the right to go before the immigration court, and we're very pleased about that. There were a lot of proposals over the summer um, to eviscerate the rights, the due process rights of kids from Central America, and fortunately that has not happened, um, and we'll have to um, make sure that doesn't happen. So outside of the, the unaccompanied children, adults and family groups are generally placed in expedited removal proceedings when they are apprehended within 100 miles of the border or 14 days of entry. And um, when someone gets an expedited removal order, they're placed in detention, they're subject to mandatory detention, um, they have no right immediately to bond or parole, and um, they will be immediately returned. There's a bar to admissibility for five years. Um, they may ask for a credible fear interview. And while people are definitely placed in credible fear proceedings, many, many people told me when I was in Texas that they were either not asked or when they claimed that they wanted to ask for a credible fear interview, they were told that they would never qualify um, or that they'd be detained for months and, and it would be, take a very, very long time for them to, to go through the process. Um, and then other people are, the officers just sign them up for the credible fear interviews, and so it just really depends on. Meredith, who we should probably another minute or so. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. So there's so much to talk about on the border, and I could go on forever. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to tie it up by saying that um, the ABA did publish a report back in 2010 that Don talked about, and that report does make several recommendations, like strengthening the adjudication system, curtailing the use of expedited removal. Um, and allowing the asylum officers to grant asylum in credible fear cases and not have to pass the cases over to the immigration court. So. Thank you. Thank you. So the, it, my first statement always has to be a disclaimer so that the Department of Justice lawyers who may or may not still be there out there don't sweat. <laughs> uh, I am not representing the opinion of the United States Department of Justice, the Executive Office for Immigration Review, or the Office of the Chief Immigration Judge. I'm here in my personal capacity. I'm president of the National Association of Immigration Judges. Uh, they trust me enough to let me out without any uh, leash, real <laughs> or <laughs> imagined. Um, and what I'm saying will be what I have learned from 10 years of private practice, uh, the highlight of which was representing uh, Luz Cardoso Fonseca in front of the United States Supreme Court, um, and from being an immigration judge for 27 years. And being the president of the National Association of Immigration Judges over the last 12 or so years, I've had the opportunity also to speak to many, many of my colleagues uh, across the nation. Because I know what persecution is, 10 to 12 minutes on any of these subjects is persecution per se. <laughs> so I defend Meredith, okay? And it wasn't fair for that to be asked of us. Um, my way of solving this problem is to ask that you follow but up. I will cut you off after 12 minutes. I know you will, <laughs> just like the Supreme Court would. Yeah. Uh, but I'm gonna come in under. How do I do that? Because we have an outstanding new website that you won't find on <laughs> Google yet. So please write this down. Okay, www.naij, that's naij-usa.org. That's the National Association of Immigration Judges, naij-usa.org. Why? Because naij.org is the Nepali Association in Japan, mm. much to my chagrin. <laughs> Okay, under the publications page, there are a lot of policy statements, including the policy statement that I'm gonna talk about today. There's also our newsroom where we highlight um, 
speeches and press coverage that we have received um, that will let you know a lot more about our vision for the immigration courts in the future and the problems that we see there today. So I'm just going to try to whet your appetite. Um, I have run out of adjectives to try to explain how overwhelmed, how much in crisis we are. And in fact, I've created my, my newest metaphor. We are the canaries in the minefields. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know we should be canaries in the coal mines and we should be walking through the minefield, but it's conflated because I don't have very much time. So you gotta put all those images together. And we're the canaries in the minefields. When people ask me how I do it, um, my mental image is of the guy in the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain doing all those things. That's what I feel like when I'm in immigration court. I really strongly recommend to any of you that you come to court and observe if you haven't already. Lawyers think they know what's happening. Uh, we don't have bailiffs most of the time. We may not have court clerks most of the time. I am frequently in court by myself operating the video uh, which is the televideo or the video recording, um, which I'm sorry, the audio recording, the digital audio recording. Um, if there is televideo equipment, I am operating that as well, and I am not great at that. Um, so we are severely under-resourced just in the practical help that we need. You heard 408,000 plus cases pending before the courts today. There are only 227 field immigration judges, 227. If you do the math, that means we have more than 1,700 pending cases per immigration judge. And I can tell you, when I last checked my docket, I was at 2,513, because those cases are not evenly distributed. Uh, where I am in San Francisco on a non-detained docket, um, it may take you 12 to 15 months to get your first master calendar hearing with me before the juvenile surge. And if you came to a master calendar hearing with me last week or two, I was setting your final merits case in August of 2018. Okay? It kind of makes me want to go throw up after master calendars sometimes. It is just unbelievably overwhelming. Okay? And I don't see how that can contribute to justice. Uh, we need resources. Obviously, we need resources. We need to double, some of my colleagues even say triple, the size of the current immigration bench. Because immigration law is unbelievably complex. Even the exalted circuit courts recognize that it's second in complexity to tax law. And with all due respect to tax lawyers, over the 40 years that I've been in, the, almost 40 years that I've been in the field, I think we've surpassed them mm -hmm. at this point. <laughs> because immigration law is sedimentary, we never repeal anything. We build on it, no matter how crazy that might be. And mm -hmm. so you have to excavate down to the old layers mm -hmm. to put things in context, right? Mm -hmm. And to be able to do it right. And that's extremely, extremely difficult to do. But just look at the rules for US citizenship, and you'll see the only way anyone can do it is with this intricate chart that tells you you were born here and did this then. It's impossible. When I started, I could memorize the grounds of inadmissibility. I could tell you where they were in the statute by number. Not anymore. So you add this complexity and then go back to the charge Don gave me of let's talk about accelerated proceedings. Let's talk about expedited removals, okay? On our website is the letter that we wrote to Congress trying to explain why it seemed the opposite of common sense to us immigration judges to flip the docket and put the cases of juveniles first. Juvenile cases are not the kinds of cases that can go more quickly. They are the kinds of cases that are going to be the most slow on our docket in terms of the difficulty of finding counsel for them, the difficulty of building a relationship of trust with your client to get someone not to just feign compliance, but to really tell you the true stories. And the advocates in the field will tell you. It takes many, many sessions with those kids to get them to trust you. 
And then this morning, I, I was really pleased to hear Senator Lara say, immigrants don't go to the government for help. Some of us come fleeing their governments. Well, that's the truth for them in the court system as well. They assume we're aligned with the same policemen who brought them here. And so there's a real problem with that perception and how to try to create and instill public confidence that they will get an independent and neutral system when, who's my boss? The Attorney General of the United States. So I have some opinions on that. We need to create that non-coercive situation in court for people to tell their stories. And how do you do that when I'm, are you finished yet? Counsel get to the point. Um, it's a very difficult role to balance and something that needs to be rethought. I do understand that the hearing time on the docket is the most precious resource, but the only way to add that is to create more time on the docket by hiring more immigration judges. The temptation to bypass immigration court for many of these proceedings, which is where I, in my mind, put uh, expedited removals and stipulated removals and reinstatements, I lump them all into bypasses because I only have a few minutes, so <laughs> I've got to generalize broadly. Those bypasses, I think, uh, don't work and have real serious consequences. There is a higher error rating, I believe. You expect a Border Patrol officer, with all due respect, I could not do his or her job. I honor them for what they do, but their job is not my job. My job is to figure out this insane definition of aggravated felony, which is different in every d different state by basis of what the crime is, which is different depending on when the crime was committed, which then will affect what rights someone has. I think that's a pretty high level legal determination. I'd like to think that because I usually don't do it alone. I bounce it off a judicial law clerk when I have one third of their time or one half of their time this year because we're getting better at that. It used to be one quarter of their time. But with all due respect, I don't think that a non-legally trained Border Patrol agent who might have to analyze it in light of a split in the circuits mm. should be the one making that determination as to whether or not someone is subject to mandatory detention and therefore, or expedited removal or a withholding only proceeding. I think the error rate is unacceptably high. You know, we know that these stakes in these proceedings are incredibly high. We understand that these are death penalty cases in a traffic court setting and that if a judge makes a determination that's wrong, somebody is sentenced to their death. That sometimes because of the incredible complexity with the asylum definition, which someone earlier mentioned as well. It, someone may honestly fear persecution, but there may be difficulty in deciding whether the linkage that's needed for the on account of peace is satisfied. That's cutting edge legal work to make that connection, to establish that, to get the country uh, resources that are necessary, to get the uh, psychological experts and the country condition experts to testify. How can someone unrepresented in a truncated proceeding before a, a border patrol officer make that showing? So because I want to leave time for questions and not go over my time, Leon Rodriguez started out with saying there's nothing like the energy and the values of America. And I like to remind people that the immigration court system is often the only face of the American justice system that many of these foreign-born individuals will ever see. If we want to export democracy, we need to show them our best foot forward. We need to show them the best legal system in the entire world. And that has to be the little old low level, trial level immigration court because that is probably the only face they're going to see. Imagine going to your deportation only seeing this face. <laughs> okay, but the good news of all of this is with the dire predictions about comprehensive immigration reform, I, I kind of like Anna Navarro um, am, am kind of innately optimistic. And I look at immigration court reform and moving the immigration court system out of the Department of Justice and elevating it to an Article I court, I see that as the sweet spot 
of compromise between conservatives and liberals on the immigration spectrum. It will lead to quicker, more efficient removals, but they will be fair. And it will be cost effective because people won't challenge the determination, because they will really and truly know they had their day in court. And we have found that that is judicially economic, our circuit courts will not be clogged, and it will save us the immeasurable cost of the unnecessary loss of human life, which we unfortunately know does occur and shouldn't be thought as of as merely a collateral consequence. So I urge all of you to look at our website, to consider the Article I issue, and realize that that's another solution that's out there as well. But give us money, too. <laughs> we do need that, I don't deny it. Under time. Perfect segue into John, too. John. <laughs> Hi. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about resources, and um, I've, I'm not a, a lawyer. I've, I'm an economist. I've en enjoyed immensely uh, listening to all these very um, experienced and intelligent lawyers talk about these issues. Um, but one issue that, that I want to focus on is the idea that we could establish mm. a system where uh, Council for defendants in immigration removal uh, procedures process is is guaranteed by the government and funded by the government as a right, if you will. Um, and so I was asked uh, to work with the New York City Bar about a, starting about a year ago to develop analysis. Um, of this issue, and I worked with lawyers uh, working pro bono from the law firm of Wilmer Hale. I worked with Mark Nofery, who was then at the Center for Migration Studies, I believe, and with other people affiliated with the New York City Bar on this issue. Um, now, to analyze, the, the purpose of the study was to, to twofold. First of all, to figure out what the cost to the federal government would be of a mandate that provided publicly funded, federally funded counsel to all defendants, all respondents in immigration, in formal immigration removal proceedings, that is in proceedings where there is a, a notice to appear in, in immigration court. And secondly, to, to make the argument and develop the argument that, the, that whatever the cost of that might be, the, the net cost of that um, would be much, much smaller in that the federal government would uh, realize a number of, of budgetary savings in, in, in providing counsel to defendants or respondents, and that um, it is even conceivable that the lawyers would pay for themselves and that the, the cost savings would be so high that the net cost of this would be, would be zero. So I just want to go over the analysis quickly. It's, it's quantitative as opposed to uh, what you've heard so far, but I hope you'll bear with me nonetheless. Um, so the, this, as I said, it's twofold. Uh, first of all, I'm going to flip this around and look at the cost savings first. In order, in order to understand the cost savings, we need to come up with some idea of what impact lawyers will have um, on basically economically. Um, and that boils down to two things. Um, one is the idea that, that lawyers would uh, make the immigration proceedings more efficient, that they would run uh, with fewer government resources. Um, and secondly, that they would be more accurate in that immigrants, uh, immigration respondents would be more likely to get the right decision out of immigration courts. Those with um, uh, those with a, a claim for immigration relief would be able to obtain that relief. Those who don't have uh, grounds for removal would not be removed. So um, the, one of the main benefits uh, to making the process more efficient is that the process would run more quickly. Uh, detainees, and, and that would lead, the biggest cost savings is that that should lead to reduced detention times for detained 
uh, immigration respondents. Uh, this could come from a, f a few different sources. Uh, detainees would no longer need to seek continuances to look for legal counsel or to prepare their cases because if they're indigent, they would be given uh, counsel by the federal government or by an organization sponsored by the federal government. Uh, on the other hand, uh, detainees <coughs> without much uh, chance for relief would uh, have credible counsel who could explain that fact to them and they could uh, accept remove, prompt removal and not have to spend excessive time in detention and that, that would reduce the government resources spent, for reten spent in detention. Um, the other possibility is that uh, with lawyers, more respondents would successfully secure release through bond hearings and thus also avoid detention and that also helps lower, lower the government's detention costs. Um, on the other side, more accurate hearings would presumably mean that more respondents would win their cases uh, and therefore fewer would be removed, fewer would be deported. Uh, and this would have a number of, of saving, this would result in federal savings in a couple of different areas that I'll, I'll go into in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, first of all, let me tell you how we analyzed detention cost savings. And, and I wanna say that in all of these things, uh, the there isn't very good information out there where, where people have done nice uh, focused studies on what the impact of lawyers is on detention time, on case adjudication, and on any of that. So what we did is pick bits and pieces of this study and that study and put it together in, in as, as balanced a way as we felt we could and hopefully came up with <coughs> unbiased, although inevitably rather imprecise, uh, answers to the question of how much would lawyers cost and how much would they, how much savings would they provide? Um, that being the case, uh, in order to look at detention costs savings, we start with uh, the fact that there is in place now a, a legal orientation program that is funded by the federal government that reaches something like a third of immigration respondents. And there has been a study that uh, for, for detainees who re receive a legal orientation program, their detention times tends to be reduced by about 11 days. So keeping in mind that two thirds of, of respondents do not get these, uh, get this uh, sort of uh, know your rights presentation, if we were able to give those, everybody lawyers, the, the two thirds who don't already get know your rights presentations would be explain their right, would have their rights explained to them by lawyers and would certainly, almost certainly get at least an 11 day reduction in their average detention time and probably a lot more. So 11 days seems like a conservative number to use. Um, on the other hand, there are, all, in, in addition, there are also um, many detainees um, seek consul but fail to get counsel. And these are both those who have know your rights presentations and those who don't. Uh, and presumably, uh, most of them fail to get counsel because they can't afford it or because counsel isn't available in whatever remote um, detention facility they happen to be held in. Um, federally provided counsel for at least indigent respondents would solve this problem. And we estimate that uh, that would be about 34% of detainees. And if you look at the, the time that, that continuances tend to take for looking for counsel uh, uh, for d detained population, we estimate that this would save on average 13 days of detention per respondent. Um, now we add this, so that's, that gives us two measures of the number of detention days that would be saved by providing counsel, two kind of conservative baseline numbers. Uh, we, come, we have two different estimates of what detention costs per day, and that ranges from $159 to $161 uh, dollars, uh, per detainee per day. So um, if we, we do the math on both of these things, the 11 days for the two-thirds of the population 
and the 13 days for the 34 percent of the population. The first one gives us a, a reduction of $81 million. These are, this is the entire uh, ICE uh, detention budget for FY14, which is $2 billion, and we hopefully could take, we could take, congre the congressional will being there, we could take two slices out of that pie, $81 million uh, from the baseline, and another $94 million uh, avoiding continuances for people who could other otherwise were unable to, to locate consul. Okay? So um, those are two, so that's our baseline calculation for how much uh, we could save the government by reducing detention. Uh, now on the other side, we, by making, in order, we can also save money by making proceedings more accurate. And in essence, that means by improving the win rate for respondents. Um, now, we don't have a good estimate of what impact lawyers have on success rate for respondents overall. So we went to the, the numbers we do have, which are for asylum cases. And what you see in the bar chart there are the, are the comparisons in the yellow are the win rates for unrepresented uh, asylum seekers. And the total bar, the yellow plus red, are the win show you the win rates for represented asylum seekers. And this is broken down by detained, partially detained, and never detained asylum seekers. And a partially detained uh, asylum seeker is somebody who starts out in detention and at some point secures release from detention, possibly through a bond hearing. Um, and then uh, continues their case uh, outside of detention. So this is our estimate of what impact lawyers would have. Obviously, we'd love to get better numbers, but this is, seems like a, a fair place to start and an unbiased place to start. Uh, now, where, how, how would this save the government money by uh, allowing cases to be adjudicated more accurately? Well, there's a couple of things that we, we managed to uncover with help. Uh, first of all is, interestingly enough, in the area of foster care. Uh, uh, the study that is cited in, in our report, and by the way, I should say that our report is available on my company's website, and, and anybody who's interested could go there and download it. It's, it's NERA, N-E-R-A dot com. And if you, you type in the search for immigration, you, you'll certainly find the, the report, or you look for my uh, page on that. Anyway. Um, one of the areas is in foster care. Uh, there's a study that, that shows an estimate that at any given time there are 5,100 children in foster care in the United States whose parents have been either deported or detained uh, by the immigration uh, legal system. Um, the annual, co annual federal cost of foster care per child is something on the order of $28,000 per child per year. Now, these children don't generally spend an entire year in foster care, but we're talking multiple children spending shorter amounts of time, but that's multiple children stretching out over a year, amounts to one, one year, one child. Um, by w and there also are state costs, which we're not including in this for foster care. Typically, the federal government and state governments share foster care costs. Um, if we increase win rates, we can get the parents who are detained out of detention, and they can take care of their children. They won't lose them to the uh, child welfare system. Uh, and and those, those parents also won't get deported, and they won't, for various reasons, be unable to have their children follow them when they're deported. So for both of these reasons, we think we could reduce foster care, children in foster care, which is certainly a good thing in and of itself, and it would also save the government money. Our estimate is that we could save, we could reduce the number of children from by, that are is currently 5,100 down 600 to 4,500 at any given time, and that would save the federal government alone more than $1,800, $18 million. Okay. okay. And um, the other thing we could, um, we could also save uh, on transportation costs. Um, it turns out higher win rates mean fewer people being deported. 
um, that we could eliminate over 17,000 departures, and we think that would save the federal government $9.8 million. All right, so that's the foster care pie. It's a big budget, but we even taking a small piece out would save the government real money. Uh, likewise, the transportation, immigration uh, transportation budget, we could save $10 million out of that budget. Um, question is, how much would it cost to provide this funding? Uh, in the interest of time, I'll run through this fairly briefly. Um, there are, we estimate, about 93,000 um, cases without representation in FY14. Uh, we think that these immigration cases tend to be bimodal. There are cases that don't take much time because the respondents don't really have any uh, likely claim for relief. Uh, we have been advised by various sources that those, it would take a lawyer about an a hour and a half to deal with those cases, not much time. On the other hand, the complex cases where relief has to be sought would take a lot of time. We estimate, based on various sources, 85 hours per case. So that amounts to 2.9 million hours of attorney time per year if we give counsel to all immigra immigration respondents. Uh, if we assume that lawyers can work about 1,800 hours a year, the same as in a, a, a typical law firm, that means we, we need about 1,600 lawyers uh, funded by the federal government to provide um, counsel to respondents. Um, when we consider salary, benefits, management, overhead, uh, and use data coming from the Legal Services Corporation as an analog, we estimate that the cost per lawyer all in is something like $128,000 per year. So we do the math, 1,600 lawyers, $128,000 a year would mean it would cost about $208 million to provide uh, counsel to all uh, immigration respondents. Well, it turns out that our estimate of the benefits when you look at detention costs, um, detention costs, foster care, transportation, depending on the range, those benefits range from about $204 million to $208 million, about the same number. So we think on, under reasonable uh, assumptions that lawyers could indeed p just about pay for themselves just looking at these forms of cost savings. Uh, this leaves, does, leaves um, aside all various benefits we didn't, either couldn't quantify or didn't spend the time to quantify, including the fact that the respondents who would otherwise be detained or deported are free to work contribute economically to their communities, and hopefully we could economize on court resources, and there would also be cost savings for states. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So why don't, we, why don't we jump right to questions now? While people are lining up, I'll pontificate for just a second to remind people that the um, CBP and ICE budget each year is $18, million, $18 billion, and the immigration court budget is $300 million, which is 1 60th of that amount. So say it was 1 20th of that amount, and we added, we added right to council, government-funded council, we would still be, we'd have a much better system, and it would actually, uh, it would actually work a lot better. But go ahead. Hi, thank you. My name is Jonathan Ryan. I'm an immigration attorney. I work at a non-for-profit called Raices in San Antonio that works mainly with detained individuals and unaccompanied children. And I just wanted to say to Mr. Montgomery, I'll do it for 120. No problem. <laughs> um, we need we need 1,600 of you. Of you right. <laughs> and and overhead and, and that would all be the a rest. very bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but um, my uh, question was for uh, uh, Judge Marks. Uh, again, as an immigration attorney, I can't pass up the 
opportunity to ask a judge some questions. So uh, I wonder, you mentioned your, your docket of 2,500 or so cases. Do you know, either for yourself or just in general with the, the members of your uh, uh, union, about how the breakup of applications is of those 2,500 in terms of what applications uh, are, are doing that? And uh, my, the reason for my question was uh, if you had a kind of response on how the TVPRA did change the adjudication in court of the unaccompanied minors cases bringing a lot of those applications to USCIS. And I'm wondering, you know, for those people who might be waiting until 2018 to do a 42B, a 10-year cancellation case, maybe just to get hung up in that date by not being able to prove physical presence in a year, it, what's your thought of maybe moving more applications to USCIS for adjudication and potential referral, adding a fee to those? That was about three questions in there. <laughs> One, we don't have the granular statistics. They're not kept in that way. Um, that's one of the frustrations, I think, for people who try to study our system, that our data is compiled to help court administration purposes, but not necessarily to help public transparency. We think Article One would, would improve that situation. Um, your second question was, do I know the balance? Of well, just in terms of how you feel about applications uh, for those in removal being moved to USCIS. And now, see, that from an ethical point of view, judges cannot uh, comment on things that start going towards substance. I don't think statistics have been kept, except maybe through uh, USCIS might know which of their asylum office cases were adults and which of them were juveniles under the TVPRA. But I don't think the court has kept those statistics. Um, and I don't think our association has collectively come to a position as to whether or not we're happy with uh, authority being delegated elsewhere, such as giving um, I-130 adjudications when there's a case in proceedings, should that come to the court? These are philosophical questions that have not been resolved, to my knowledge. Since I, there's no one else in line, I'm going to hog the mic. Uh, to Mr. Montgomery, uh, what does the privatization of detention and the fact that a lot of these officers who run those corporations pay good money to the re-election campaigns of the uh, lawmakers who uh, maintain the detention system in its current numbers due to your economic argument? Um, it doesn't do anything to the economic argument. Uh, it, it, it does say that, you know, it, these cost savings require the, the Congress to decide to reduce the budget for detention. If they're going to get cost savings, they actually have to take advantage of the savings. Uh, the fact that there are, there is a, a private economic interests that would be harmed by that by that is is obviously makes that politically more difficult but i guess that's you know ultimately a political question it's 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 a very good um economic analysis it doesn't get into the politics of it and there's you know there's not a whole lot of evidence that one federal bureaucracy will be willing to forego work to save money for another you know that so that another bureaucracy or that the federal government overall would save money and another bureaucracy would take on that work so I think but that's the that's more of a political challenge the study is really excellent yep thank you question okay. yeah yeah so um, my question is for um, Judge Marks um, it's an honor to meet Sorry, you, can you go to the mic? thank you oh hello yeah uh -huh. okay is that better okay um, I just wanted to get your perspective on uh, the reports that discuss the significant variations in asylum decisions, um, the significant variations by court and by judge. Um, uh, hopefully it's very interesting work. Yeah. <laughs> I think the conference organizers right. have been involved yeah. in some of those studies. Right. I, I just wanted uh, to get your perspective as an immigration judge. Uh, uh, not only are we the canaries in the minefield, we are the guinea pigs as well in certain things. I'm unaware of any other core that has had decision making studied in that way. Um, and there are, I think it's a very important starting point to look at the diversity um, amongst uh, various judges in similar courts under what we think are similar circumstances. But I think it's very difficult to analyze data on those cases when to my knowledge, the EOIR data capturing system does not differentiate between Judge Marks de denying an asylum case because there is a clear one-year bar that the person concedes, or it was an issue of litigation, or where Judge Marks denies uh, an asylum case but may grant withholding 
uh, because of a criminal conviction or maybe has to deny withholding because of the severity of that criminal conviction. I mean, there's so much nuance in the decision-making process. Um, and I always wonder as well about what studies have been done with um, sentencing guidelines and whether those have been successful or not, and, and there's been data on that as to whether it was appropriate to put those guidelines in or whether it caused unfairness if you have too much control over those guidelines. I wonder about the role um, when you have juries and where a jury may just be personally moved and kind of ignore the law but grant the case. Uh, has that really been studied? So I don't know if immigration judges are like everyone else or if there is some difference that is worth noting and, and worth trying to uh, balance in some way. I think we're still at the infancy of discovering some of those variables and understanding what they mean. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Richa Mather, and I had a question about the sustainability of legal representation. Um, I know you mentioned a great deal about programs that are investing in fellowships and the recent surge um, in finances due to the unaccompanied children um, crisis, but I'm wondering, um, is that something that you see more investment in and long-term investment, and you mentioned some models um, for retaining legal representation, and I'm wondering if it's you know just for this period of time that we're going to see that, or if you do see that it's going to grow in the future. No, I, I um, see that it'll grow in the future. I think the fact that the federal government, for instance, has started to fund programs is very significant. The fact that um, uh, a city like New York is spending as much money as they are on programs, um, that you have people like Judge Katzman, which really wasn't. His interest wasn't really generated by unaccompanied children, but rather by detained aliens not receiving adequate representation. That's really what started the Immigrant Justice Corps. So I think these are all very sustainable programs, and um, I think they'll grow over a period of time. And what will happen is there will be a, a cadre of pro bono lawyers, or, or I should say lawyers who work with these organizations who have, um, did build real expertise and can pass that expertise on, and there will be much more mentoring available in the system, um, which will allow the pro bono lawyers with large firms who are trying to do pro bono work and small firms as well, it'll provide them far more guidance. Um, so a lot more efforts going into training. Um, meaningful training. I mean, programs that um, are you know very comprehensive and um, quite lengthy. So I, I think these programs are sustainable, and they will grow. Another aspect that that I think is interesting that a lot that I hear a lot from um, pro bono lawyers in large law firms is that the backlog situation of the docket in an immigration court is a disincentive for them to be able to assume pro bono representation, which they otherwise would assume for people. It's a great experience to come into immigration court. Many uh, associates in large law firms could use the litigation experience, the real world experience, but because our cases last for years and years and years, right. it's a disincentive for law school clinics to help. It's a disincentive for um, new associates at law firms where the, they may not be there in a few years. They're often uh, short-term programs of a few years. And so you fund the immigration courts, it could help that and increase pro bono as well, which is a hidden factor that a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, excellent point. We have, why don't we take one final question and we have the perfect person to ask it, Karen Grise. Uh, thanks, Don. I don't know if it's a perfect question, but I had a couple questions for Mr. Montgomery about the study, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, one mm -hmm. is, did I misunderstand you to say that you were surveying only the time and making the calculations based on asylum seekers, or was it everybody in removal proceedings? Um, yeah, no, um, everybody. Uh, okay. What we don't have is an analysis of what impact legal representation right. has on case outcomes generally for immigration cases. Um, and the problem is that immigration cases are kind of heterogeneous. There, there are lots of different issues and, and different claims to relief. 
Um, we used, we have numbers comparing um, outcomes um, with representation, without representation for asylum right. seekers. So we made the assumption that the difference in the impact of lawyers for asylum cases would be similar in other types of immigration cases. And that's a working assumption based on lack of any better evidence at this point. But it, it's meant, the analysis is meant to apply, apply to all immigration cases. Okay, thanks. And um, two other quick ones. The 13 days that you projected for um, continuances for lawyers seemed to me, based on the review of a lot of cases, to be actually quite short, not, uh, not counting possibly the surge docket cases, but typical continuances for ascertainment of counsel are much more than 13 days, and I wondered if you, if that was a net somehow of those cases that took more time um, once there was a lawyer, and, and that's what took it down to the 13-day point. Um, well, it, it's, again, based on the information we have, but this is for, uh, it, it seems likely that um, continuances uh, take a lot less time when the respondent is detained than when they're not detained. Yeah. And we made the, so this is meant to apply to retained uh, respondents. Um, and I'd have to go back to the tables in the paper to go run you through the analysis, but there's a table that lays out the analysis in the paper. Okay. Um, again, um, you know, if you have other information, we would be delighted to have it and would be delighted, delighted to work it into the next study. On okay, this. thank you. And the last one I had was about detention versus um, not detained. And did you factor in the costs of alternatives to detention, the ankle br bracelets or any of the other apparatus in either the de costs of detention or the costs of non-detained? No, we didn't. And it's a, it's a good idea. Um, if, if you're... Um, our detention cost savings are, again, for only for people who are in detention the entire time they're in the process. So they wouldn't be um, released from detention while still in the process, and then you might have an offsetting cost of an ankle bracelet or whatever other monitoring. On the other hand, it could be that if the case works better for somebody who does have an ankle bracelet, the government could save money there too, and we didn't be another savings. You know, just. And we're very grateful, John, after all these years, to have a study like this, a real economic study. Of, and, and, and of course, we can you know, play with it a little bit and hope, hope there are other versions of it. But thank you for doing it. And I wanted to thank all of, the, all of the panelists. I also wanted to thank the people who organized this conference, but who you d never see up on the stage here. So let me just list a few. Rachel Reyes, Daniela Al Alulema, Lisa Dixon, Maura Moser, Allison Posner, Michelle Middlestadt, Brianna George, and many others. So thank you to all of them, and thank you all for being here.